warm in in your area? We had a heat wave last week in the, I guess Celsius was close to 40, 33, 35, yeah. you know. Now today it's uh, cooled off, so not too bad. It's nice July afternoon. Yeah. So. Yeah, yesterday it was up to 90 for a while, not long, but dropped back down overnight to 57. That was great. <laughs> made for made for a good night's sleep. It's going to be warmer tonight, and then rain tomorrow. The humid up there too. Yeah, yeah. But we got a bit of a breeze, which makes a difference. And. Uh, what I've done is is put up a uh, a blocker to some of the sun coming into my mosquito proof tent. Uh, put up a, a garbage bag on one side, which blocks the sun, but not the view, and that cut the heat down inside this uh, transparent tent. Uh, so that uh, uh, with a little bit of a breeze we have, it it probably cools it down about ten degrees. Oh, not bad. Yeah. You met Zach. I met Zach. Yes, I did. <laughs> uh, young. A uh, gentleman, much, very much like you guys, you know, uh, um, inquisitive, not uh, pushy, but uh, um, doing his own thing, learning his own way, and... Uh, he must have appreciated what he heard because after he left uh, on Wednesday, um, he had taken me to town to do some errands with the car he had. And, and when he left, he said, it's my last day tomorrow, um, I guess at the uh, room and breakfast where he was staying and uh, shook his hand and he went on his way. When I got up in the morning, there was a, a package on my chair uh, which suggested he had returned <laughs> during the time in between the, he left and, and I got up in the morning which is fairly early, six o'clock or so I come outside, I start, you know, feeding the animals inside the house, the cats, and then I come out uh, to feed the goats. And uh, he had left a package with six blueberry muffins. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, thank you. So uh, he must have appreciated the time he spent, I guess. He was going to, I guess, drive to Ottawa and turn in the car and take a flight out. So I don't know if you heard if he's back home or not yet. Yep, I spoke to him shortly yesterday. Um, yeah. So he said, yeah, he told me about that. He was baking some muffins for oh, you, yeah. <laughs> the muffin man. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, he said he enjoyed his time, uh, learned a lot. Um, he said he had a, some good recordings, too. He's going to have to go through and, and see what, you know, put it all together. Yeah. So that was well, it's been a while since you guys did that here, so... Uh, yeah. Ten year update or something. Yeah, yeah I mean, 
that's definitely something like Jared and I talk about a lot, like trying to get back up there. And I think the airplane way is probably a little less restrictive. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's, yeah, because they already scan you and go through your stuff at the airport. So they don't, you know, when you drive up there, they rip your car apart and everything, you know, but, uh, at the airport, they have the x-rays and stuff, so I think it's a little bit easier to pass through. But, um, yeah, we talked about that, trying to get some type of at least film of you. And cause I, I know the last time you did that video was before I met you, the one that, yeah, you know, that formal, you yeah. a formal uh, conference. Zach and I, you know, didn't do anything more formal than two people talking together, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. But I, I think he got all the uh, the important points. I, I mentioned to him that, uh, just like you guys, he's uh, 26, and uh, when he arrives here, um. I think you guys were about the same age. Yep. Yep. About that. And uh, well, today's today's my uh, today's my uh, reborn day. So thirty-seven today. <laughs> thirty-seven. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know you me. Go. <laughs> <laughs> so I told him that uh, he has uh, fourteen years to go before he reaches the point where all of the evidence he'll need to make uh, judgments on are still a while away, but uh, this is a, a good period in your life to gather up bits and pieces, some that make sense at the beginning, others that don't, but evolve over time and others you disagree with that's normal so he's on his path following your lead yeah yeah and i think also just because of you know with technology now like people can and also of Jared and I being able to record conversations that we talk so people can listen to them multiple times. So by the time they do reach you, at least some of that background yeah. is already taken care of and they can ask some deeper questions that maybe we're not asking or, you know, because it's a different perspective. So it's, well, it's, more, uh, yeah. it's always based upon what they have learned over their 26 years and it's it's good that his background, from what I understand, is uh, a little more rural than what you would get in New York City. Yep. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's it's coming at the uh, questions and answers from a much different point of view. I explained to him that, you know, the uh, place has changed somewhat uh, since you guys came, that when you were here, we had a raft, mm -hmm. uh, which served the purpose at the time, but over time, since I'm trying to modernize the... Uh, the place a little bit my my view of course is that what i'm doing here is not for me but for the neighbors and the neighbors because of um, the uh, concept that i have that um there was a time in the past uh, that is described in, in the Bible as um, a flood 
that uh, took the life of many people um, called Noah's Ark. And, and that, uh, of course, that's all coding for genetic engineering. And the coding suggests in the story of Noah's Ark that none of the neighbors uh, responded to what Noah was doing and only ended up saving a few people close to himself. Uh, and, and then if you look at the diagram of the Big 8-0, -O, which is a diagram of the journey of humans on the planet since what it calls Adam, uh, then you see that each step and each name on the chart is basically just a name given to a period in time where the genetic engineering they have done has driven the population away from the center in the direction of the time when Noah appears on the chart, and then a cataclysmic decline occurs, and a re rebuild has to take place over time, which to me suggests that because the people who were the neighbors did not respond, they were wiped out. And the drivers of genetic engineering came to the conclusion that there was something wrong in the way they had developed the people of that day, um, and therefore they should be wiped clean and a change in the formula or recipe of genetic engineering had to take place different from what they had done leading up to Noah, and, and then it could be allowed to continue until a point where they conclude that the people's personalities have changed sufficiently the way they want it going in one direction, and then they reverse the direction going back in the other direction, which basically at the beginning makes the first half of the big O with a glitch at Noah, and then uh, it begins on a more refined second half of in the same kind of time frame, making two O's shaped like number eight, uh, much more uh, in line with the center uh, following the directions of Adam. Now, when you understand the coding structure behind it, and that basically can't be taught in a day or a week, but it's a lifetime process. Uh, when you understand what is going on, you, you start to understand that Adam has a name that really, in the code, becomes the word medi. Medi, by replacing the A's with uh, E's, that's why in a lot of secret societies and in their graveyards, you see a lot of A and E 
which basically says they were on board with that concept. Well, Mede is, on the one hand, media, and mediocre, and medicine, Mede Sydney. Uh, well, Mede was the capital of what we now call Iran at the time. And and uh, it it also includes um, uh, the concept in there that you come out of water and you travel on land and you return back to water and travel on land afterwards, which ends up making the shape of an ape. So it was interesting looking at the vehicle that he brought, uh, which uh, was made uh, or sold by a company called Surgeoner. And a surgeon is basically the only legally authorized person to kill people. We do it in a hospital during what they call surgery. And the fact that a surgeon name comes from a fish called sturgeon. Sturgeon is a deep sea fish that swims to a landmass and and goes up a freshwater stream and swims as far as as many times the center of the continent, uh, and that here gets done on the St. Lawrence going up to the Great Lakes, Minnesota, uh, Viking territory, uh, and from Montreal up the Ottawa River to Ottawa, the capital of the country, so that it it adds to the story of how genetic engineering is controlled below ground, underwater, and people are sent out as sturgeons would and come into the center of continents and then operate as surgeons in hospitals to cleanse the population of the people that disagree with their philosophies. So when I was on Parliament Hill, I told Zach uh, that there was a guy, and I think I've told you before, uh, there was a guy uh, with a, a Polish, um, Russian, that area background, who had come to Canada as a refugee of some kind, and he must have been a, a spy or something, because they gave him a uh, room, uh, an apartment, in a building close to Parliament Hill. Uh, they gave him money for food, and uh, they asked him while he was here if he would go to Parliament Hill and keep an eye on me and report back you know, on uh, what I did and 
that kind of stuff. And he was on Parliament Hill on and off for about uh, half the time, I guess, I was there. So I was there a thousand days, almost three years. He would have been there about a year and a half. But we got to talking, and he told me about he had been a captain in the KGB in the Soviet Union days. And uh, uh, I said, well, how are you making out as far as living and, and eating? And he said, well, I'll take you, I'll show you the apartment I have. He said, it's a one-bedroom apartment in a building of about 10, 15 stories. Uh, comfortable. Uh, uh, furnished, uh, and then he said, "I got a stipend for for eating, but it leaves me no no money uh, for anything else. So I'm not going to die from starvation or cold, but uh, I'm not uh, able to do what." normal Canadians might do in their spare time. So coming to Parliament Hill and talking to you is, is uh, fine with me. So um, he, he told me a story. He said, what I basically do is on Friday night, I boil potatoes. And I'm able to get with the money they give me for food. And I cut them into cubes. And I've got a bicycle that I get on and and uh, travel down the, the Ottawa River towards Montreal direction, which is basically a little south, but more going east. Uh, and he said there's a place about 20 miles outside of Ottawa that um, has a kind of a fishing hole, uh, describing it as, as something like a, a wharf sticking out or something like that. And he says, on Saturdays, my task is I throw into the water all the cubes of potato that I boiled the night before, and then I pedal my way back home. He said, then I make another batch of potato, and on Sunday... I pedal my way back to the wharf, putting in uh, hooks into the pieces of potato. And guess what? He says, I catch sturgeon off that wharf, and they're so big that it, it becomes a real problem just getting them back home on on the bike. But he said, I'm basically used to it now and, and wiggle my way back home. And I said, well, what do you do with two big fish like the sturgeons you have? He said, well, I met a guy who owns a restaurant, European background, restaurant, and I made a deal with him, uh, smoke my two fish, and you can keep one, and I'll keep the other, and that was the deal they made, so he makes his way to the restaurant, gives the guy the fish, and then when it's smoked, he takes it back home, he's got, got a fridge on those smoking basically doesn't require the same amount of coolant. But he showed me his 
refrigerator and it was stacked. And he said, you know, that's, that was my main food when I was living in, he always had a problem saying which country because they changed the borders there all the time. Sometimes it's called Poland, sometimes it's called Lithuania, sometimes it's called Russia. But uh, he said, uh, hey, that left me all my food money I now have for doing things that I might want to do, like go to the theater or, or whatever. So, Sturgeon coming out of the Atlantic Ocean, swimming up the St. Lawrence Seaway, turning right at Ottawa, going up to Ottawa, being caught by a Russian uh, pole who came to Canada from foreign country, feeding him and, and giving him a lifestyle which is basically better than poor Canadians because of his background he had learned how to take care of himself which is not the case with people in Canada most of them basically are either told that they'll be supported by welfare if they uh, they don't do anything because they don't really want Canadians to be in charge of the country. Uh, they want immigrants that they've genetically engineered to do that job. Uh, so we talked about all the different things you and I have talked about. I didn't go into detail because I grasped that he had heard a lot of the stuff before. He didn't have to go into the details of them. But it seemed like a uh, uh, well-brought-up gentleman. Yeah. Uh, he... Uh, I asked him if he intended to give the Institute some kind of donation, and he told me yes. And I said, if you don't mind giving it to me now, because if you don't, I never know when you leave here if the government doesn't grab you and throw you across the border or something, mm. as they have done with Jennifer. And he gave me um, $70. Uh, he said it's a deposit against what I, I plan on giving you. Uh, then he found out that he was having trouble cashing uh, or getting some money from his his credit card in Canada because of some uh, uh, misunderstanding, I guess, between him and his bank. He could get money off his um, bank card, but not his credit card. And in between, he had spoken to his mother uh, of course, his mother, thinking only of her son, said, you know, you shouldn't be giving away money or whatever. Buy, buy a lottery ticket, and if you win, you can give him some. Uh -huh. So <laughs> what he gave me afterwards was a U.S. dollar, which I stapled <laughs> into the center pole of my tent. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's fine, you know. It's what he can afford at the time. It's all that's required for creation and the pineal court and, and uh, the cell is that you offer 
what you have. At a later time, the court in deciding your eternity decides on whether or not you could uh, really afford more and and didn't. Uh, And then the court will make a, a judgment on whether that was right or not. So anyways, hmm. he came, he says he learned, I learned things from him, same way as I learned from you and Jerd, you know, uh, mm-hmm. I'm way past your ages and, and been there, done that type of thing, so <laughs> I need to know how that changes over time. And uh, he left uh, a uh, much uh, appreciated half dozen muffins <laughs> and, and went on his way. And I'm glad to know he made it home. I told him that it's impossible to make phone calls without other people listening in. Uh, other people who may not have uh, a, a personality that understands the motives behind uh, helping others and are more self-serving and how they can misuse their opportunities on earth, but creation always has the last word and deals with those things when when God takes them out, creation lifts them up. Yeah. Yep. So that, my friend, is my four days, I guess, with <laughs> Zach, he arrived in a very uh, strange manner on, I guess it was Sunday. The, um, I had forgotten my shirt, and they had announced that it was going to be uh, below 60 degrees overnight. And my shirt was in the tent outside because I, I wear it in the morning when I come out to feed the animals and make coffee. Uh, then I hang it up because it's too warm outside. And mm-hmm. I came out to get it. And there was a car parked just inside the gate. And I went over and the doors were open. And the guy was taking pictures and stuff like that. And he's, he just said, hi, I'm Zach. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I went and got my shirt. And uh, I told him, uh, are you here for a while? And he said, yeah. But I, he said, uh, I have uh, no place to stay because I... I've got a bed and breakfast, but I uh, I can't go until tomorrow. So I said, well, if you want to, you can sleep in the tent there. Um, and he looked at it because it's not really a tent. It's just a mosquito cover. <laughs> he said, uh, I, I, I think I'm going to go into Kempville. Um and I guess when he ran into the problem with his car in Kemsville, he slept in his car overnight is what I figured he told me. Mm. And then the next day he was here uh, and and uh, went back to the bed and breakfast where he was able to cook his own meals and stuff. He'd buy things at... Uh, Walmart, like potatoes and and onions and uh, eggs, 
and uh, he'd cook there, but on, on the last day he cooked here just to see, I guess, what it was like when I wanted to do something. Mm-hmm. And uh, use my, my little stove and frying pans. And, uh, he said he enjoys his own cooking, so that that's okay. <laughs> Anyways, he, he spent the time. We had a good conversation back and forth. He left uh, late afternoons and would come back late morning. And, uh, of course, there's a lot of things we can't do anymore like we did with you, which was to take you guys for a walk in the bush and show you where the cell came and, and that kind of stuff and at the back. But that's all grown in because I... I haven't been able to spend time doing that and and worrying about the circumstances surrounding what they're doing to me up front. Yeah. Uh, I, w- I was just before you called making uh, my first list, I guess, of uh, what has occurred since 1986 in a so-called democratic country uh, called Canada. And the first thing that set me on my new path, I was born in 1942, and this is 1986. So the new path, uh, was after the age of 40. Uh, the first thing was they stole my development business in Hull, Quebec. Then in 1988, by threatening my family, if I went to Parliament Hill, they stole my family. And then 1988 to 1991, they stole democracy during the time I was on Parliament Hill, where they demonstrated to me that the teachers of Canada who had arrived with a school bus full of kids would go berserk the minute one of them walked towards me, quote unquote, the lone demonstrator on Parliament Hill, uh, as if demonstration was a crime. They stole democracy. And then we went to court in 1991, and they stole the power of the court on orders of the media that I had found uh, a glitch in their cover-ups by filing a private prosecution, successfully bringing in witnesses who convinced a judge that uh, the government was running a 5% kickback scheme through the chief of staff, four cabinet ministers and four senators on Parliament Hill. And then they stole the power of the Ontario Provincial Police by saying they were going to uh, stop the charges that had been laid by the court from going forward and reinvestigate what information she had received. Now, that's about as silly as you can get, uh, getting a provincial police to investigate the federal police as to their testimony in a court of law. In any event, it was just a a crime of cover-up, and the provincial police started or continued down the path of no power to the people. And then 
I ended up on a farm, which they basically um, killed in the hospital my only tenant, uh, who happened to be the person who did what I didn't have time to do, like cooking, and Tom. When I was in the hospital, the uh, uh, doctor, female immigrant from India, came and asked me what I thought about DNR as as his uh, guardian. And I said, what are you talking about? He's, he's not on the verge of dying. He just needs intravenous feeding, and that's what you're doing now. And as long as you do that, it'll be okay. But then two hours later, they called me up to tell me that he died. And uh, information uh, was given uh, to uh, a guy from Ottawa who was supposed to be doing an autopsy, but it in fact, looked like he had been more interested in finding out the genetics by uh, uh, checking the mouth, the feet, and circumcising a 76-year-old man uh, so that when he went back to Ottawa calling himself a coroner, he called me on the phone and said he had the notes from the nurses and he um, understood that I wasn't happy with what had occurred. He wanted to tell me how uh, there was no reason to be unhappy because, and, I, and he started talking medical concepts, words, and I said, excuse me, uh, my wife is right next to me here, and she's a director of nursing, and if what you're telling me uh, I can't understand, she will. So please repeat what you're saying. And then I heard Joseph, Jennifer say, um, was there a bottle or something in between the bottle at the top of the pole uh, leading to uh, a needle in his arm. Was there anything else in between? And he said, yes. And I heard Jennifer in a kind of automatic reaction saying they killed him. After having listened to everything he had said for about 15, 20 minutes, wow. that, that was her conclusion. Of course, who do you go to when the, the police already have proven that they don't care, that it's all part of the game? So... A little later on the same year, police came to the farm and kidnapped Jennifer and four times uh, border guards dumped her on the highway in New York. Four times she walked back and then they kind of realized that maybe they had to put her further away. So. They flew her to uh, California trying to tell the police there that she was crazy and they questioned her and, and disagreed. <laughs> but by then she was in California. So they decided next to shut off the hydro to the house in 2016. Of course, they knew that 
houses in this area uh, have a uh, a pump in the basement that uh, sends back outside any water that rises. And however, here I had told them that I knew there was something going on under the house and that uh, it, it was something to do with electromagnetism. So they they decided that I knew too much, I guess, and, and shut off the hydro, therefore no pump, and therefore three times a year or so, flooded basement up to the window sill level type of thing. House, of course, tips, and doors don't close properly anymore, and walls break and that kind of stuff in in a house that has no more toilets no more cooking facilities no more refrigerator no more lights and uh, uh, 15 cats walking around (laughs) and uh, of course some cats uh, love me because I feed them. <laughs> Other cats hate me because in the dark I stepped on their to- on their tail. <laughs> <laughs> and um, recently, the last moves in eighteen and nineteen is they've begun stealing from my pension. And last time they had to put it back. And this time, they've made it permanent. Or so it appears. So that's my journey after the age of 40 that um, has nine critical events to either... Control me, control Jennifer, or control the cats. I don't know which is their preference, or is all three the idea, because it appears as if killing us, but not instantaneously, seems to be their project. That's from a government whose media claims is the nicest place to live because of government in the entire world. (laughs) Well, maybe someday uh, governments from around the world will start using our case to demonstrate to the people of the world that maybe they shouldn't be running off as immigrants to Canada because it's not what the media told them it was. And a guy like uh, Zach and and you guys uh, can probably assist in the day that happens. One thing about Noah was that he realized none of his neighbors ever came to help. All of the help for whatever there was came from distant places. And here... Uh, last winter, I received bowls of soup on cold winter days delivered in thermoses uh, that probably helped me stay uh, from being frozen to death. And the people who did that lived in Kempville. And I received 
sweaters and and headgear and stuff from you and Jerd in a place called New York. <laughs> but never anything from the neighbor right next door. On um, all three sides of me have made it almost a purpose of their lives not to have anything to do with me. My question is, if the worst thing I've done in my life is fight for democracy, what has gone on in the world to change at least this neighborhood, the police, the hospital, municipality, all of which have been informed of what has gone on. You know, if if a neighbor uh, to the south of me there, uh, across the field from where I'm sitting right now, had said, I heard they cut off your power. Is there anything we could do? I would have said, if you show me your hydro bill for your property um, and you allow me to plug into your outside plug, I will lead an extension to my vehicle, which doesn't work anymore, my truck, but in which I have a heating device. And I will keep that as a reservoir of a place to go sit and thaw. But he never asked, and I never did. The neighbor to the north is a woman who knows who I am, whom I brought Jennifer to meet when she first was allowed to come into the country two years after being delayed in Ogdensburg, who has claimed on the net that Jennifer was a very nice person, has done absolutely nothing Across the street, there was a family called Gorel. And the family called Gorel moved out to someplace around Kempville, leaving the husband, uh, Gorel, alone on the property, but with the dogs, but going back and forth, I guess, for meals or something to that effect, maybe laundry uh, with his family. Um, And um, two years ago, I guess it was, uh, I stopped seeing him, but the guy that replaced him looked a lot like him. Now, the house had not been sold that I knew of, uh, but I could only see the person from my distance and and in the back of him, so I, I wasn't sure if it was Mr. Gorell or not. But one day there was a storm, And looking out of the front door of the house, uh, and that was before they shut off power, so it had to be uh, three years ago, I guess, or Mm -hmm. around the time they shut off power. I have trouble remembering that. Um, the line of electricity that goes over our property has a pole on the property. Um, The law says that 
hydro is allowed to put in a hydro pole 20 feet from the road and reserves the right to put in uh, a thing at twice that distance uh, should it be required for emergency or physical reasons of some kind. Well, that post is 45 feet from the highways, therefore five feet outside their jurisdiction. And it has three wires at the top, and it has a ground wire which is not covered with any material whatsoever. And over the years, I have noted to the people at Hydro uh, that this was the case, and they said, oh, yeah, 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 okay, we'll send somebody. And I think three or four times came and went, and nobody ever came to do anything. So I gathered that there must be a reason for it not being covered, since the one across the street, which is fed from here with only two wires, has a cover. And, and obviously, if you send a surge down these uh, extra wiring they have over our heads, uh, and it bounces uh, at a stop someplace. It's going to go mostly into the ground and into the property around it. Well, this property uh, is uh, responsible because the people to the south of me used to live here, and their son, who stayed in the basement, uh, their their son, uh, who would now be probably 35 years old or so, uh, was mentally handicapped when he was born. Uh, the son of the Gorels across the street was mentally handicapped when he was born. Tom was uh, making note about the noises beneath the house, and so was Megan, who was here at the beginning, one of the original financiers of the house, saying, I can't stay here. There's too much noise underground. Uh, and when I went to look, uh, I established that the ground uh, from the house to the basement was uh, immovable. Uh, as it stood, and I was trying to pull it out, and I couldn't do it physically, and I got a, the truck out. And the truck could not pull it out. And so I asked the guy next door, the husband of the woman who used to live here, um, if he would know any reason why, having dug four feet into the ground, I could not budge that, that uh, rod. And he said, oh, it's because it's 20 feet long. And I said, that's impossible. How could somebody stand on top of the house and punch down a 20-foot rod into the ground? That's ridiculous. And he just looked at me, and I went back home. Uh, the next morning... Uh, I went down to continue my digging because I had determined to get underground to a place under the basement uh, at approximately the middle so that I would know if there was something going on with all of these noises. And on my way down there, I discovered that uh, in the normal construction of a house, people would put in a large pipe that, that can accumulate water coming 
close to the foundation and lead it back up to a place uh, that is lower outside and um, not cause any damage to the foundation. And that here, that had been put in upside down so that instead of picking up the water and taking it out, it was taking it from the surface and bringing it to the foundation. And uh, there was a very noticeable pattern of large rocks um, getting uh, uh, larger and larger uh, as as they went down uh, and into the underside of the house, uh, along with a lot of gravel beside them that appears to have been rocks that were there and were shattered in one way or another until they, over time, became gravel. And but I still had the problem of of the rod feeding down in that direction. Uh, so I was continuing at the same time as turning underneath the house, trying to move that rod. Well, I I couldn't do it that morning. And uh, so I, I figured, well, I've gone down about four or five inches more, so I'll, I'll spend more time on going under the house. And I was working at digging out a shovel, putting it in some large container or large con compared to a plate, and pulling it out and dumping it. And on about the second or third dump, I slipped and fell against the rod, and it fell over. And I couldn't understand how a rod that a minute earlier uh, I had tried to pull out, the day before I tried to pull out with the truck, would just tip over. And then it struck me that this was very much like the story of Arthur and the sword in the stone that somebody had rigged a stone with a sword and turned on the electricity and made it impossible to pull so that they could send anybody they wanted to pull out the uh, sword uh, and either deny them the right to be king and then send the person they really wanted as king, one of their own, and shut the electricity off, and he would be able just to slide the sword out. That story is written about Northern England in what is known as the Dark Ages in, in that period, about 400, 500 A.D. So it's not knew what's going on with me. Hydro yeah. is the bully. Hydro has the word rod in it. And hydro is directed to do what they do by someone with enough influence in the government to tell the police to ignore them and, and don't bother them and, and assist them if they ask for help, such as they did with me when I said, no, I don't give you permission to cut the trees out in front. And they brought 
two policemen to stand by me while a caravan of vehicles came in and topped off all the trees. So I don't believe for a second that Canada is the only place in the world that this goes on. It's just that I'm basically made to notice these kinds of things and do the linkage. Now, I was told by the cell uh, after about a year of meeting them, which I, if I remember correctly was in 2006, uh, one of the things they told me is that um, if I found uh, a special lady that I would consider being married to, let them know first, and they'll give me an opinion, uh, which they later did, uh, saying that, yes, Jennifer was the right person they were hoping for that we somehow would get together, but that they were not going to suggest anything until it happened. So in any event, they said, for your own information and for the knowledge of anyone else, if they should care, although most people won't care because they only believe what the media, a.k.a. Adam, has told them along the way. And that is that you and Jennifer were born in a prehistoric period equal to 42,000 B.C. And that you, in fact, over time, have requested and have been granted the right to go and attempt to inform the people of the Earth about what happened in the past and that has occurred that so many times that this is your 700th visit. Unsuccessfully, we may add, in uh, getting any majority of your neighbors to agree. Much in the manner in which in your time, during a period called the Dark Ages, I guess, uh, I'd have to look the exact dates, uh, but of uh, the activity of Noah led for him to flee in the ship, the boat that he built, uh, is maybe a story. However, it's an explanation of the events that occurred and that genetic engineering needed a study done at that time about have the people learned the lesson uh, since you, the beginning of your journeys uh, into the world? And the answer was no. No more then than it is today. Any help you would get would have to be at a distance not from anybody who is in the neighborhood. So they said at the same time, the lady that 
uh, you will marry will have had 37 visits to the planet and hers would be involved more on the monarchy military side than yours and if the two of you got together you will quickly realize that your personalities in dealing with things are opposite. However, with the two of you put together in a single person, uh, marriage type of arrangement, uh, not necessarily a marriage that's just a government sponsored co control mechanism uh, started by nuns, uh, passed on to monarchs uh, over the beginning stretch because of the transfer of land uh, as, as they died in the Middle East on some of their escapades uh, so that the nuns could end up being the beneficiaries of all of the land, not just the royal land, they suggested that marriage among uh, ordinary people be added to the control mechanisms. So Jennifer and I got married only for the reason that getting her into Canada would be more permanent and easier than if we were not married. If we were not married, she never would have been allowed across the border the second time around once they understood what we had in mind. So Jennifer had to live two years in Ogdensburg, was allowed to come in only when there was a threat on her life, and she was making a refugee application. Both judges who heard her application suggested to the controllers that they were not making an instant decision because it seemed to them at least that uh, Jennifer at first had uh, the possibility of having been born in Canada to some nuns or um, because she was now married and part owner of a farm in Canada um, would, would allow her. And thirdly, there was no uh, other reason, legal or criminal or anything in her background that would say she was anything other than director of nursing, psychiatric hospital, and, and therefore would not have married Glenn if she thought he was crazy. She would know the difference. And um, so all of those things pointing towards Arthur and, and the friend she lived in after she was returned uh, to California, uh, who then was murdered within a year. Uh, drowned in a wading pool uh, that he used to go to on a regular basis, but only after bringing his change of clothes and everything, which he had not done that day. And uh, one has to ask themselves, where does coincidence end and programming belief, uh, programming begin. Is it possible 
that everything that I know of is just a coincidence. And I say, no, it's not possible. And I say, before the Ice Age came, and you got to remember a number of lives from 42,000 to 24,000 B.C., where the Ice Age began, a group of people which calls themselves the original had acquired knowledge about plant life, animal life, humans, over a period since approximately 80,000 B.C. Now, if you start at 80,000 and you go to 24,000, that's a long, long, long time compared to the knowledge acquired in the world mostly made itself known beginning of the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, and makes itself visible in the 1900s and year 2000. Everything from the beginning of the end of the Ice Age, 8,000 B.C., was simply to reestablish human life on Earth divided into two groups. One who would be visible to their neighbors and other countries. Another one underground in and look at your telephone and type in Moho discontinuity and you will see a red line area underground. And there establish a control society who would in fact be looking at what they knew from the past that eventually this planet would die, as all things do. And when it dies, they'd have to die with it. Unless and until they could develop a knowledge of space travel in order to extend the period of their lives, they would die both top and bottom when the sun committed suicide by exploding itself and shrinking itself. And that it had been larger in the past and it was constantly getting smaller and smaller to the point where more than likely, Mars was Earth back in those early days of 80,000 B.C., or had been, and they figured it out. But as the sun shrank, there was a movement of something not living, but that could make life happen that flew off and ended up on this planet. So what they decided was the period of time between 24,000 
B, C, and zero coming back down to 8,000 B.C. on the way was an opportunity for them to take control of the world. And so they did until a period of about 3,000 B.C., where they began to formalize that takeover by creating Egypt as the center of the new world post Ice Age. And shortly thereafter built the pyramids and Giza the cat big lion type cat that would hint at the beginning of mankind, probably at around 2500 BC. But in the time of the Ice Age, a lot of work was done to remove from sight any signs of life that had existed prior to the Ice Age. Few things remain. A hint at the things that remain, Easter Island with different statues, which basically says from the beginning of the time, this side of the Ice Age, we in fact have had this many visions of the recipe for genetic engineering that we had to evolve through to bring human beings to what they are by the age zero. Hence, that are never explained properly, however, serves their purpose to this day. Now, if you were underground in the world and you had a pre-made network called the Moho Discontinuity of space that allowed you to stand in and walk around, albeit with its deficiencies of size of rooms, unconnected rooms, and all of that, it would be your task to link everything together. And if you simply have the possibility of moving forward five feet in a year, so be it. Five feet in 24,000 years is a long time. Add 10,000 more years since zero, since, as I should say, since 8,000 BC to 2000 AD. All of that time allows you to 
pop up in places that are unoccupied and give you a hint as, as to how best they could be used. And those places that you find easiest to rise to the surface, you push up and make a hill so that later on you can tell whoever you've brought there that that's where you should build your headquarters. Parliament Hill, Capitol Hill, that type of stuff. But not necessarily all government. Um, but places that are different from its surrounding, basically. And if you um, if you look at your telephone and and have it tell you where you live and what the elevation is, you'll realize one thing quite quickly is that the elevation of where you are changes every minute of every day. And that's because you are sitting on a floating plate on the surface of the planet, and that floating plate rises and falls so that when it's measured from a specific location in space, it changes. Here I'm told 70 meters, one minute, and then it rises to anywhere up to 80, 85 meters, or drops to 40, 60 meters, on a minute-by-minute minute basis during the day. Now, I don't feel it, but obviously, if the object that is doing the measuring has been located at a place above the Earth where it is in sync with the Earth and never moves, what is moving is what it's measuring at the bottom of its radar, laser, and it moves up and down. And that would be the same for the entire world. We're on plates. Now, deep down inside the Earth, there's a core. But in between, there's other things. And those other things include a small space called the Moho Discontinuity. So a society of people living below the tables of the earth and above the mantle of the earth, which is above the core, could in fact, over a period of 24 plus 2, 26,000 years, build a tunnel network and know where places are on Earth long before they are ever occupied because there are not enough people in 24,000 to do what they want done. And that's to put in a laboratory such as the government of England is called labor or Tories, 
put in a laboratory a study of the entire planet at sometimes pretending to be the boss, a conqueror, as they did in Egypt, while in reality having a reverse position with the first and second humans born on Earth, albeit unknown to the average person who goes to school or learns democracy. First place is, of course, Africa, followed by the second place, India, which explains why one is black and the other one is brown. On its way to become Asian, which is called yellow, um, later on white, although I keep looking at myself and I don't see much white. To me, it, mo- it looks more like tan, at least since I spend the time outside. And the people who live indoor uh, are all kind of in a... period of time, I guess, that will allow them to travel from pink to tan. Now, the word tan is not an accident. It is the word ant. And it describes where the controllers are. They are underground, and make their living genetically engineering formulas while surviving by going above ground all over the place, grabbing what they can carry and bringing it down to where they want it. Now, what they want, of course, is people who they can identify as having had a certain personality and a certain result of their lives, like living in poverty or living in wealth, so that they can see how the correlation between the person and the uh, formula or recipe that they had made these people out of over time. And to do that, they, for example, make news of a ship being built called the Titanic knowing that only a segment of the population could get on the Titanic because there was a price range there, and having that ship, quote-unquote, hit an iceberg, uh, at least that's how they explain it, and sink to the bottom of the ocean, where their people who have the ability to come out of the Moho discontinuity through a space more than likely extinct volcanoes uh, would then uh, get over to the ship, uh, grab the bodies and take them back, identify them genetically as to who they are, check their reputation from media above, and uh, know exactly what they have now obtained in the far uh, in the concept of genetics, 
and explaining why it is that no one who has gone down to the Titanic and it's been made off limits to the people of the world, but a few people have been in, that they have been unable to find the residue of any single body. The same applies with airplanes that disappear. The same applies to the triangle off of Florida. What goes down is not an accident. What goes down is simply the people of the Moho discontinuity needing access to certain types of people in order to identify how their formulas for genetic engineering can or should be modified. So here we are. Who can be behind me? Well, obviously, if you take out royals, bureaucrats take over. The bureaucrats have tools. One of the tools is a border where they can limit access to only the people they have genetically modified and will become adults 20 years later on. They have access to a taxing organization such as we have called Revenue Canada who can modify your ability to move around or survive by cutting your pension fund, which they did last year and were caught it with their hands in the pill and had to put it back, in my case, However, they have repeated the same thing this year, knowing that nobody gives a shit and the media won't report it. So they appear last month to have started the process over again, which is to cut my pension by a third, $900 less than what the government had said I legally owned. That's terrible. Once, once they have done that, and you look and say, how can that be allowed? And then you say, and who do I turn my attention to to remedy the situation? My choices are bureaucrats, taxation people, police, banks, and yet I know that all of these people have two things in common. Hydro and Bell Canada. So the orders obviously are you in the middle watch what happens we at Bell will give orders, and we at Hydro will enforce orders. All designed to go along with you bureaucrats 
limiting access of his wife, killing his tenant, and cutting his ability to survive in any way you can figure out. such as cutting his income by a third. Now, that's the life I've lived. I mean, I haven't touched on anything prior to 1986 because that was the 44 years of my learning process. If I start with what I remember, I would start at the age of five or six. And that would mean that about 40 years of my life, I lived at a time when I knew what was happening around me. And it all goes back without my ever having realized it while it was happening, this original 40 years, it all goes back to preparing me for where I am today. Negative things and positive things. Negative things that turn into positive things. Positive things that turn into negative things all which seem to be out of my control. But not forgotten. Not understood, but not forgotten. But since 1986, with all the background of learning in the 40-some years behind me, I began to assemble a jigsaw puzzle. Couldn't figure out what the picture would be but obviously figured out that it was all pieces that would someday come together. And the cell told me after I met them, and, and I no longer remember dates in that relationship because it all matches and mixes into one learning lesson, It all matches to come to say, let me tell you, Glenn, that in the period of time between now and creation's direct takeover, things will happen and things will change and things will seem terrible and things will seem good. And in the end, when the time comes, all the people who try to cause you pain, you and Jennifer, and prevent you from achieving your goal of being on the farm together will fail. And they will be dealt with according to their involvement in the criminal activity. But you and Jennifer will be there together at the end. We can't 
because we're not allowed to tell you when that end will come. The primeval court will inform us and creation will inform the primeval court. We are simply investigators bringing to the court the information we collect about people and how we suggest they be, they be treated once, quote unquote, God, the satrap boss of the earth, who was allowed to have control as an experiment by creation, has proven creation to be right and the governor of the earth to be a criminal. The governor of the earth, if one looks at the power of money, is nuns. They, since the creation of religion, out of people who used to be military but were no longer able or wanting to fight, religion was created. Think of what happens when you retire from uh, the military, you join the legion. Religion is re-legion. You go back into the system, but in a different task. Religion. And those people who want to control, whether in the military or in religion, uh, need a system called government and corporations so that they can allow entrepreneurs to work their butts off building a, build a business, bankrupt them, take what's good, put it into the corporation, and let everybody else Stop, stay standing, looking with their mouths open when they lose everything they invested into this entrepreneur who gets the blame while the corporation gets the profit. Corporations are just governments on a smaller scale. The bad guy that enforces everything every step of the way is hydro and telephone. They have created a worldwide system of communications called post office. So what they don't hear on the telephone, they sneak out of the mail. I got so many envelopes with the open here that my complaints led to them having to send me a letter when the next one came uh, inside a big transparent envelope, they put my letter and saying, oops, we opened this by mistake. Bullshit. 
If you made a mistake, you must be making millions because you wouldn't have gone to the trouble of making these transparent envelopes to stick the open mail in. You opened it on purpose because you wanted to find out something on purpose whom the one who had it could not tell you and therefore you needed to find out on your own. Such as how much mortgage does he pay? So there we are for today, my friends. I don't know if Jerd came in along the way or not. Yeah. Yeah. I'm here, Glenn. You know? you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> so I, I, I will special. leave you for now, having done what I can do today. And hope that you can make the best of it. I now have to go feed my cats. Okay. Stay cool out there. Thank you. You too. Everybody have a good day. Bye for now. All right, Glenn. Bye.